So I'd like to bring it back to fine-tuning in the standard model and SUSY and so on. As you said, that uh, there's no evidence yet for SUSY at the Large Hadron Collider, but also we're now in this stage where, even if we find it tomorrow, the model that emerges may require some fine-tuning. Do you think we have to move into a world where we simply have to live with fine-tuning, or are there other options on the table? So there may be other options, um, but some of them actually also require a certain level of fine-tuning. So one which uh, I like is actually very light particles, but not necessarily as light as uh, sterile neutrinos. So for example, um, a, a long time ago, I introduced light particles, meaning below the proton mass, coupled to a new mediator, a new particle that we wouldn't have seen. And when I introduced this, um, at the time, there was a lot of freedom because there were no experiment looking for this new type of particle, so light at least. So at the time, um, you could propose more or less whatever you wanted, and there was a good dark matter candidate. It was a, via, you know, a valid mechanism for explaining uh, all the observations. But now they have, you know, there are lots of experiments putting constraints, and uh, when you look at the parameter space, if this model is correct, then there would be a fair amount of fine-tuning too in order to make it work. That's one possibility, of course, and then there may be over, I mean, everybody has his preferred dark matter candidate and model, but given the level of experiments, uh, or experimental accuracy we have now, it seems, like, and we didn't discover anything, so it seems that um, we will always have a certain amount of fine-tuning. Uh, perhaps one option uh, where fine-tuning is not a problem is if dark matter is extreme he extremely heavy. In this case, we don't know the theory because we don't even have a good framework to explain such masses. We don't, we don't know the physics uh, above a certain scale, which in this case is about 1,000 times the proton, so a TeV scale. And so we do not have the right framework to determine if there is fine-tuning or not. But it seems like we would have a lot of freedom. And so maybe there, there is no problem. So as, as we've gone into this discussion, we've talked about different kinds of fine-tuning. There's, there's the fine-tuning of fundamental physical parameters. There's fine-tuning of model parameters that we may you know, we use in effective models to understand the data. But presumably, there are kinds of fine-tuning that are more easy to live with than others. So for example, I could think of a, a particle mass and say that it could, in principle, be anywhere in this enormous range. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if such a particle exists, it will have a concrete number. And I could live with that fine-tuning, you know, the, say the mass of the top quark, for example. It, it has a number. Whatever that number is, one could call it fine-tuned. But it must have a number, and it is what it is. And I would not necessarily worry about that unless you tell me that the whole theory falls to pieces if I change that mass by 0.0000001% or something. And that's a very different kind of fine-tuning. So, so which sorts of fine-tuning uh, are we talking about when we, when we talk about where we're at at the moment with the standard model and with supersymmetry and so on? Well, so in, uh, in the standard model per se, uh, we have the masses. I mean, we, we have only known things to some extent. So there's no real fine-tuning in the standard model per se for the reason that we actually have only uh, the value of the parameters. And uh, there are not so many, I mean, there are not degeneracies, basically. Now, the reason why the mass are what they are, we don't know. I mean, we can, to some extent, you can fit with a parameter, I mean, with a Higgs boson and, and some parameters. But we still don't really know why those particular values. And this is probably the challenge of tomorrow. But in terms of new physics, when you propose uh, theories like supersymmetry, uh, it's clear now that uh, you need basically this level, so it's a percent, it can be worse than that, but you need a high level of uh, degeneracy between particle properties to make the theory um, invisible to us. And that may sound weird because you may think, well, why do you try to make it invisible? And the reason is that if you don't make it invisible, it's killed already because you had observation, I mean, you had enough data and it wouldn't survive the data. So. So now it's becoming vital for this kind of theories to have a certain level of fine-tuning to be alive. Then when we uh, assume that we make a discovery, we see something, supersymmetry or whatever framework we, we can understand, and we measure fine-tuning, then the question is, is it fine-tuning or just chance, I guess? And that's, that's where we, 
we wouldn't know without a more complete picture. But at the moment, the level of fine-tuning we need, the fine-tuning we need is basically to survive, <laughs> is to make the theory uh, still alive. But if tomorrow we discovered supersymmetry with these you know, perfectly chosen parameters such that it can dance through the constraints of today into the hopeful measurements of tomorrow, uh, if I then change those parameters by small amounts, would the theory still work or would we, would, would we be in trouble? So it is very likely that we do not have, uh, we do not access a theory. We'll have only a model. And this means that basically we will not be able to tell by changing the, the parameters whether this is making the whole picture falling apart or not. Uh, because we will need probably something far more complete to be able to tell. But um, we I would expect that we know, for example, that if you don't have this level of degeneracy in between the masses or the couplings, or that you will realize that it's not going to function. So at least I think you will know that you need this kind of level of, um, you, will need the, you will know the amount of fine tuning you need, and then you will not know the reason why you need this, but at least you will, you will know that this is mandatory. So to move to a sort of personal or philosophical uh, dimension to all of this, do you, do you have a feeling for, well, what would you prefer, would I say? I mean, do you feel that the universe uh, has some reason for being the way it is, some deep underlying reason? If we had an overarching theory, it would predict all the masses and coupling constants. These would come out, this would be emergent from that theory and it would be unavoidable that the universe would be like this or rather similar to this? Uh, or do you think we are going to be sort of inexorably drawn towards some more anthropic type argument where we are one of an infinite continuum of different possibilities and then we shouldn't be surprised that the universe is just so for life because, well, here we are. So, so I personally don't like the entropic argument because I don't think it brings any answers. It, it just tells us to stop thinking. And uh, I, I just don't like that, <laughs> personally. So my, my feeling is that, you know, in the same way as the standard model, we have observations which, which are difficult to interpret and we don't try, I mean, we stop basically trying to interpret. But I think at some stage we will need to go back to those things and understand and I would expect a revolution in terms of um, uh, big picture, basically. I, at the moment, all the theories that we built are, um, use a fundamental principle, which is symmetries. We always assume there are some underlying symmetries, whether they're space related or whether they're really related to the properties of the particles. And um, I personally believe the next challenge is that we will have to give up this principle. Because I feel, but I may be wrong, but I feel like we exploited as much as we could. And we're always using the same type of symmetries. Maybe there are more symmetries, which are not perfect symmetries. Maybe it's a bit different. Maybe symmetries have a meaning, a deep meaning that we didn't explore yet. So I personally think that we're going to end up, whatever the answer, whether we found the dark matter or we don't, we will have to question ourselves about the meaning of the finding. And uh, I think we will have to basically revisit the basis. <laughs> so you think we need something relatively radical? I think so, but I'm a radical person, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it may be that it just reflects my, uh, my personality. But I'm, you know, the standard model is extremely successful. It's very beautiful. To some extent, it's a mathematical construction, but to some extent, it's rather simple. It's just um, a few principles, and then you can predict everything you see. In the same way as in cosmology, it's just a few principles, and it's also very successful. But we didn't explore. Uh, I mean, basically, we were expecting more things, and we didn't see them. Uh, the Higgs was one of the major components. We, we were expecting to see the Higgs in order to understand why particles had masses, and we've seen the Higgs, so we could stop here. But that doesn't explain why neutrinos have masses. It doesn't explain why there is something which all, I mean, all galaxies together. And so there is clearly something else to understand. And again, as you mentioned, with a, a cosmological microwave background, you can't say just a modification of gravity, and that has nothing to do with particle physics. Because this modification of gravity uh, must be there in the early universe. 
And every modification of gravity that people have tried so far have failed to reproduce the cosmological microwave background. On the other hand, the very simple hypothesis that there are more particles in the universe, invisible particles, but there are more particles, that works, that actually gives us the right answer. So I do think there is something that we need to understand, but it may not be uh, based on the principle that we have and all the fundamental laws that we're using. It may be something far different. I mean, I, I, I certainly agree with you that the sterile neutrino type models are very attractive. Uh, one reason for that, of course, is that in some sense we have found dark matter. There is dark matter in the universe, mm -hmm. which is the humble neutrino. You know, it, it's incredibly weakly interacting. You need to pass it through about a light year's worth of lead to have a reasonable chance of detecting one of them. So the only reason we detect them is because we have a giant nuclear reactor on our doorstep, uh, the sun, which is spitting them out at you know, trillions upon trillions uh, per second, passing through us mostly without effect, and we can detect a few tens per year in neutrino telescopes. So these are dark matter, but they're too light to be the dark matter that binds galaxies together. So if you wanted to find dark matter and you just wanted to make a guess, the neutrino sector would seem to be sensible. And it also contains these mysteries of a very light but non-zero neutrino mass, the fact that they're all left-handed, where are the right-handed neutrinos? Or there are right-handed anti-neutrinos, but where are the right-handed normal neutrinos, and the sterile neutrino can answer all these questions for you. Uh, it could also help to explain matter-antimatter asymmetry and all sorts of other wonderful things. The issue I have with it all is that if that is the answer, if that is the answer that the universe gives us, it is both satisfying and frustrating all at the same time, because it gives us the dark matter, it, it, it cleans up the neutrino sector, but it almost is too complete, because then what? Where do we go from there? Uh, we're left with all of our questions uh, and, and to my mind, not a clear path towards answers. I don't, I don't know if you have an opinion. Well, my, my impression is that cosmology is you know, the field which will lead to answers. For example, so, so far I was advocating a particle solution. But for example, if you discover lots of primordial black holes in our galaxy, uh, in our halo, um, maybe this is a dark matter. After all, maybe we don't need new, new type of particles. And maybe the matter was actually there and formed the dark matter. But uh, if we, for example, indeed, if we understand how a neutrino acquires mass and we discover a certain type of a certain mechanism, then we may conclude that this is a dark matter. The question is, how do you prove it? And, and then for that, you need to make sure that you explain the right observation. For example, um, if you want to explain the observed volic density, but the relic density, uh, we, comp we to some extent, we compute it. We deduce it from observation. And when we do this, we assume a certain model. And we do not assume sterile neutrino. We assume heavy particles. So we, we may actually do things in an inconsistent way because we do not know exactly what is a dark matter. So if we find, if we find evidence for a certain type of candidate, it's clear that a lot of there would be a lot of implication for the whole field from cosmology to particle physics. We will have to revisit absolutely everything we know, and then we will have to prove that it's only one candidate. And maybe there are many more dark matter candidates around. Um, some, some people, for example, have advocated the idea that you have extra dimension, and, and dark matter lives in an extra dimension, and we feel the gravity from it. it. It may be true, but how do you prove that? You would have to create the extra dimension. So it's, it's uh, many challenges ahead. Yeah, there's a lot of fun, sort of what you might call exotica, but as we start to rule out the, the more standard guesses, then they become less and less exotic, I suppose. Um, you know, I, I also feel that, uh, well, there's a lot yet to be discovered and a lot yet still to be seen, and I think we can learn more from astrophysics, but I really do hope for some smoking gun from particle physics soon to, to shine a light in some direction. And, and we can take comfort in the idea that, uh, well, at least she is there, <laughs> taking data. Uh, we have basically the next few years where there'll be lots, enough data to determine whether we have particles up to the TV scale. Uh, and then we have many, many more part, um, experiments, as you mentioned. So, for example, uh, direct detection, which aim to detect really the trace of dark matter in a detector. Um, they, they are basically the new generation of very big experiments is uh, starting and will deliver results in the next few years, like two, 
two, three years, um, even in a few months to some extent at the beginning. Um, and then we will already know if the range that everybody think about for dark matter, for the mass and cross-section is correct or we have to revise that. So it's, um, I think we are very lucky because we are going to see uh, all the important development unfold uh, in the next few years. We're just going to witness what's going to happen. That's absolutely right. And if I want to put my optimism hat on, we could even dare to dream that the universe may give us more than one type of dark matter, as you alluded to. Uh, because there are multiple very well-motivated candidates, and it may seem ugly to have multiple types of dark matter, but we've already got one, so we're going to have to have at least two. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we, if we look at the standard model, I mean, there are many particles, so there is no reason to suspect that there would be only one dark matter candidate. But of course, um, you need to start somewhere, and uh, assuming that there is only one, it's much easier. So. And we can, I think we can be sure that um, there would be many surprises along the way as we progress.